welcome everyone to our Times Evoke Evolve knowledge series, where we bring you discussions with people whose work is changing the world. We are delighted to welcome our extremely distinguished guest today, Professor Michael Kramer, economist, was awarded the Nobel Prize um, in economics in 2019. His work on human development and the reduction of poverty worldwide are renowned. Um, Professor Kramer teaches at the University of Chicago, and we are extremely happy to welcome him to Times Evoke Evolves Knowledge Series. Thank you for making the time to speak with us, Professor Kramer. Oh, very happy to be here. Great. Um, Professor Kramer, we'll get started right away by talking about your research. How would you describe the core of your work? Well, I think my research focuses on using the tools of economics uh, to try to develop practical innovations that have the potential to be useful for ordinary people in the, in the real world. Um, and I often I work with governments or sometimes firms uh, to identify ideas um, to, to try to address the challenges that, that they're facing and then to try to rigorously test those um, and then depending on the results, um, policymakers can be better informed about whether to go ahead and um, expand this approach or whether to try to refine it and improve it before expanding it, or whether mm -hmm. to decide this is something that just is not giving the results that they hope to see and they want to try a different approach altogether or stick with the status quo. Mm -hmm. If you could tell us a little bit about your recent work on, on water treatment and child mortality. What was the methodology of this study? What was the location of it? Uh, you know, what was the scale of, of, of this study? Some of the sort of computational tools uh, that, that you used and also some of the challenges that came up during this very, very interesting and I'm sure difficult study. Right. Um, so let me provide some a uh, bit of background. Um, so I think it seems you know very intuitive that water treatment. Uh, we know that diarrheal disease is a big killer of children, um, and it seems very intuitive that water treatment could help save children's lives. Um, but despite that seeming very intuitive, um, there's actually some. There had been uh, you know, some controversy over what the exact impact was, whether this needed to be combined with other things to be effective and so on. Um, so you, unfortunately, the existing evidence on this, there, there was some reasonably convincing historical evidence from uh, when various countries around the world, and including the United States, where I'm from, installed um, installed uh, water treatment equipment. And there, there's you know, some evidence that mortality came down afterwards. But you, know, you can always argue about that type of evidence. What medical researchers typically want to see are randomized trials, like the randomized trials that are used for new drug approval or for, for vaccines. The problem is that because the technology to treat water has been around for a hundred years. It's um, you know, the basic chlorination is not something that a company can patent right now. So mm -hmm. they won't put up money for a large scale study. The approach that we took was to combine all of these individual studies where the outcome was diarrhea because uh, very large sample sizes are needed to, to, um, to pick up impacts on child survival. And then by putting all these together, um, we would have a large enough sample. So you know, we, we combined 15 studies mm -hmm. and in using a technique called meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a sample of over 20,000 children, over 25,000 children, in fact. And this was because this was many studies, geographically, it was from around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and when we did that, um, we saw, and it was a you know a fair amount of work to assemble this. Um, um, we had to write to the authors uh, to get some of the information if they didn't report it. But when we when we put all this together, um, the results were in fact you know very surprising to us. Mm -hmm. Not in, in in the not in the direction of impact, but actually in in the magnitude. 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to actually ask you, you know, what are these studies most important and as you said, surprising findings? So, you know, I, I was expecting that we might see some reduction in child deaths from this, mm -hmm. but we actually saw a huge reduction in child deaths. Mm -hmm. We estimate that water treatment reduces child mortality by about a quarter, you know, suggesting that one in four child deaths, you know, from all different causes, not just from diarrhea, could be averted by making water treatment available. Um, 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 you know, let me restate that. Um, one in four or, uh, deaths uh, could be averted by making water treatment available. And that's, um, and I think that's, you know, particularly, um, um, useful for policy because water treatment is not something that's very expensive. If households, um, it's, it, it can, water treatment can actually be very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. That actually brings me to my next point. I wanted to ask you, you know, what, given, and you know India very well, uh, and other similar countries, what are the costs of, of such water treatment in, in a developing economy? And what are the costs of not investing in such water treatment? Water treatment is very is is very inexpensive. There are multiple different delivery technologies, but India is in the very fortunate position that um, the government is currently delivering piped water to mm -hmm. all households. Mm -hmm. And once there are pipes going into a household with water, then it's fairly inexpensive to treat that water. For chlor with uh, chlorine, for example, uh, that doesn't address all health issues with, with water, but it, it addresses microbiological contamination, you know, fecal contamination that can, mm -hmm. that can cause diarrhea and, uh, a whole, mm -hmm. and, and, and diarrheal diseases and that are presumably responsible for the vast majority of this mortality. Um, so Jaljivan mission um, is, you know, their objective is to provide not only connect all, all, all households to piped water, to, but to provide safe water as well. And you know, that, that's something that I think once the pipe is there, you know, this can be done uh, extremely inexpensively. Just to give some sense of this, mm -hmm. you know, a bottle of bleach um, the, of the type that you might use, I wouldn't recommend using bleach to treat uh, water, but a bottle of bleach has enough, um, has enough chlorine in it to treat 70,000 liters of water. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, you can see that it's, it's fairly inexpensive. This could be done for you know, a couple of hundred rupees per household per year, uh, mm -hmm. or, or possibly even less. Um, and you know, what are the costs of not doing it? Yes. Well, you know, that's one out of every four children dying unnecessarily. At least that's our, that's our estimate from this meta-analysis. It's, it's a fantastic investment um, on, on uh, it's, yeah, it's a fantastic opportunity for, for, for India right now, in, in my view. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wanted to also ask you, Professor Kramer, what are some of the demonstrable impacts on adult health, as well as, you know, benefits in poverty alleviation? Um, which such a water treatment uh, intervention can have? So I haven't done research myself on the impacts of water treatment on, on adult health, but there's certainly, um, there, there's certainly, um, um, there's certainly other evidence on, on, mm -hmm. on that in particular. In terms of the economic impact, again, while I haven't done research on water treatment, I have done, um, I'm familiar with the research and I have done research on other, uh, other um, public health interventions mm -hmm. targeted at young children. And obviously early in life is a critical period for child development and that has mm -hmm. consequences uh, in the long run. So I'll, I'll cite you know, a couple of examples. One, um, there's we you know, there's there's studies of early childhood stimulation that suggest long run impacts on uh, on on child's living on, on children's living standards when they become adults. Mm -hmm. Second, um, you know this and this is another policy that's been implemented in India. Um, I had done research on the impact of treating children for worms. Worms mm -hmm. like hookworm, whipworm, uh, roundworm. What we found, and this was in one particular setting, um, um, uh, this was in Kenya, um, we found that children who received deworming treatment 
that mm -hmm. later on when they became adults, you know, the original study was, was more than uh, 20 years ago. And we followed uh, the children's and we see that they're as adults, they're now earning 13 to 14% more. There, there's an improvement in, oh. in, in, and you know, this is also very inexpensive. It's about 50 cents per child per year to provide the medication, uh, including the delivery costs, because this can be done through schools. And, um, you know, interestingly, there's a historical study in the United States of the effect of treating worms in, in the US South, where they were very common. Um, early in the 20th century. And what was found was very similar results, improvements in education and literacy uh, as the children went through life, and then improvements in earnings as well. Um, and, you know, again, this is an area where India has really been a leader. Um, you know, the um, India has, has uh, first individual states moved ahead with this, and then, um, then this became a, a national initiative um, um, that when the prime minister created um, um, uh, national deworming days. Um, so, um, so India is now treating hundreds of millions of children uh, for, um, for worms. And I think this will have very positive long run consequences on economic development. No, that actually is, as you, as you said, it's, it's really counterintuitive. It's so logical because you, you, you know, the core health of, the, of a young child is protected and strengthened. Naturally, that child will be able to attend school better, do better at school. And then naturally that leads on to, a, you know, a more abundant life. So it's, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, you're, you're proving this um with with your work and and you know convincing policymakers and decision makers to invest in this i wanted to also ask you professor kramer we're facing you know the entire world is facing an unprecedented challenge in the form of climate change um now i wanted to ask you you know is climate change uh, impacting the quality of drinking water as well uh, across countries because this also is connected to the work that you're describing Oh yes, um, you know, climate change has, has impacts in many areas. And of course, a, a key one is on agriculture and on livelihoods for people who, who depend on agriculture and the threats to food security. Um, and you know, we're seeing the, the increase, increases in food prices now around the world. And yes. look, the war in Ukraine is, is part of the story, but actually I think that um, um, fluctuations in production due in part to weather, weather, um, you know, weather shocks are, are probably even a bigger part of the, of the story. Um, but to answer your question on, and I think there are things that, that um, policymakers can do to help address this, both, um, both um, safety net policies, and, but also things like improved weather forecasting um, um, or advice to farmers on how to adjust cropping patterns um, um, in light of, of climate change. All those things are, are very important. But to turn to your question on, uh, on, on water, you know, I think there are multiple ways that climate change is already affecting the quality of, of drinking water. So in some places where the water table is being depleted, uh, wells are drying up and people are, have to rely more on groundwater, but groundwater is more likely to be contaminated. Um, mm -hmm. Another is through floods, which can also increase contamination of water. So I think both of those highlight the need for, for water treatment. We, we need that anyway, but I think climate change is, is posing further risks to water supplies. That's really very interesting and important to know about. Um, I now want to ask you, Professor Kramer, this is, you know, something that is so closely identified with your work. Can you please tell us about your advanced market commitment approach to the health of poor people in developing economies? You know, how does this work? What does this mean? And, and are there case studies of this which you could share with us? Sure. Um... So advanced market commitments are a way to harness the power and the energy of private sector innovation to address the needs of people who, who might, would, uh, people uh, address social needs which otherwise might go um, unaddressed. Where we, we first proposed uh, this was uh, for, for health needs and in particular for vaccinations. So, you know, under current institutions, um, 
Typically, when a new vaccine or drug is developed, firms adopt a strategy of charging a you know, relatively high price initially. They then sell to only a limited population. And then that, and then later as competition comes in, maybe they, the price comes down and the, the, um, the drug or the vaccine reaches, uh, reaches people who don't have quite as high incomes in particular starts to diffuse into low and middle income countries. But that's a timely process. I'm sorry, that's not a timely process. No. It's a time-consuming process, I should say. No. And um, in the meantime, you know, people who, who desperately need these products are, are, are not getting them. And then there's a further problem for in the case of, in the case of, of there are some diseases that primarily affect low and middle-income countries. Mm -hmm. And there, the private sector incentives to invest in, in research on these, on these issues are weaker than they would uh, than 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 is needed uh, or than corresponds to social needs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how can what is a way of addressing this? Well, you know, the the basic idea is that donors um, or governments uh, commit in advance to help finance the purchase of a large quantity of vaccines if they're developed and if they meet certain uh, technical standards and if they're priced appropriately. And then that way, instead of purchasing a small quantity at a high price, a larger quantity is, per is purchased, but at a lower price. But, but governments or, or donors need to commit in advance uh, to, to do this or, um, so that that encourages the private sector to come in to develop the product. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the I think you know by doing this there are often debates about um, incentives for research and development patents intellectual property rights and there's a two very important things are often pitted against each other first is R and D incentives which are very important and second is access which is also very important and I think we're all too often locked into a debate where if we get more of one, we get less of the other. And there's a way to get both. And that's, and I think advanced market commitments offer that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked about examples. Mm -hmm. So let me give you the example of uh, uh, pneumococcus. So pneumococcus uh, was killing 1.6 million people a year worldwide. Um, there were there were already vaccines against the strains of the disease common in high income countries, mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the incentives were, mm -hmm. but there weren't vaccines against the strains of the disease common in low and middle income countries. So a group of, uh, a group of governments and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came together and they made a pledge that if a vaccine against those strains was developed and proved effective, then they would commit up to $1.5 billion to finance the purchase in exchange for some, some price commitments, a price ceiling that was agreed by the, by the if, if the companies agreed to do that. And you know, following the adoption of the advanced market commitment, uh, initially two firms developed pneumococcus vaccines, and mm -hmm. they've now been distributed to 200 million children across the developing world. And then later, the Sarum Institute of India uh, developed a pneumococcus vaccine, which is um, which is being used, um, which is being purchased through the advanced market commitment, and is now being given in India. And it's estimated that seven hundred thousand lives have been saved thanks to these vaccines. And you know, if you look at how quickly those vaccines reach people in low and middle income countries compared to other vaccines, it seems like it was you know, greatly accelerated by the advanced market commitment approach. That's excellent to know. That's excellent to know. Um, I wanted to ask you, Professor Kramer, you know, your commitment to ensuring public health worldwide is so well known. Um, what are some of the most important public health lessons you would say occurred or come to us from the pandemic, uh, which really governments can't afford to forget now? Um, you know, I think a key lesson is that the both the human uh, health and the social and economic costs of pandemics is so large that we should be investing now to try to prevent future pandemics if we can or help us deal with them more quickly when they happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the height of the pandemic, um, COVID-19 was costing the world $500 billion uh, every month, just from a purely economic point of view. 
Um, and if you're losing $500 billion a month, that creates, it's worth taking some, taking some investments to, to address that. It's, it's insurance. Um, um, so what are some concrete steps that could be taken? Well, one, I think we can invest now in scientific R&D, um, for example, on a universal vaccine against coronaviruses, on improved ventilation and filtration systems, or you know, there are many ideas, including UV lighting that kills germs. I think mm -hmm. there are also social innovations, such as new ways of increasing take up of vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, um, but, you know, this is something where the chance of a new pandemic um, similar to COVID has been estimated at 2% a year. You know, that's something that from, a, from, a, from the standpoint of the welfare of society, um, that's very important to insure against. Um, from the standpoint of an individual firm, are they going to undertake these R&D investments? Are they going to undertake the investment of constructing uh, capacity, which is expensive? Well, probably not if there's just a 2% chance that it's going to be yeah. used. Yeah. And if it does use, if it is used, you know, they're going to, there'll be limits on prices in a pandemic that's inevitable. And um, um, so I think there's a very important role for public investment. And mm -hmm. in particular, let me highlight the need for investment in manu vaccine manufacturing capacity. You know, if we can accelerate um, the production and distribution of vaccines, then that means that instead of paying this $500 billion in costs every month, instead of losing hundreds of thousands of lives every month, we could, we can, and have that go on for a year or more, that process could be done in, in just a few months. And, mm -hmm. you know, the vaccines were actually developed very, very rapidly at record speed. But because of the shortage of manufacturing capacity, mm -hmm. there were long delays before everyone was vaccinated. So I think it's worth it for governments to say, hey, we will pay to put some capacity in place, maintain it on standby. Obviously, you have to do careful inspections to make sure it's really ready to go when needed. But then when if we do get hit by an epidemic, what governments would say is we're paying for this construction, but then we want a contract so that if we if a if a if a new pandemic hits, if new vaccines are available, we want the output from those facilities and we want it rapidly. And, and uh, I think that that type of arrangement, it's very related to advanced market commitments, slightly different, but I think that mm -hmm. is a, I, I really think this is a obvious investment for governments to make, but I don't think governments are doing it on anywhere near the necessary scale. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope they will heed your words. Um, and it certainly sounds like one of the most essential investments that they should make, given both the challenges of climate change and weather patterns we, we really can't forecast accurately uh, very much now, as well as all the other pathogens um, that we already know about. So it, it really does sound like an absolute essential investment to make. Um, so I hope they will certainly take this up. Um, I wanted to ask you, Professor Kramer, now, you know, you, you worked on public health, you worked on child well-being, you teach as well, several young students, um, you know, you worked in multiple countries around the world, experienced um, so many different kinds of, of challenges and so many different kinds of experiences across um, the development sector. What has been the most moving moment for you personally in, in your work around development economics up until now? Well, obviously I was thrilled about the Nobel Prize. And <laughs> you know, that's um that's you know that's your wonderful recognition from the research community. Um but I think ultimately um um you know those of us working in this field you know, we're, we we obviously care about research. We enjoy doing research, but ultimately we're we're trying to produce uh, work that will be useful for people. And um, you know, for me, the the most exciting moment, uh, and, and certainly the way that um, you know research that I've been involved in has com contributed the most, is when the government of India decided that um, they were I, that they were going to you know, based on, on the evidence, not just from, from me, but from the, the overall evidence in the field, they were going to um, make sure that children in India who needed medication to address worms uh, received it. Mm 
because as I mentioned, you know, this is reaching hundreds of millions of, of children. And, um, and, you know, this decision by the government will, will positively affect hundreds of millions of lives or already is positively affecting hundreds of millions of lives. So, so glad to hear that. Very, very happy to hear that. Um, I wanted to ask you, Professor Kramer, so, you know, generally we think of economists as, as, as people doing their research and, and, you know, their research doesn't really, unless something massive like a financial crisis happens, um, it, it often just sort of stays, you know, in, in, in the area that they work in. It doesn't transcend into, into everyday public life, um, but yours does. So, so it, it's, it's, it's a huge change, uh, you know, from the way we think about economics. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you have a message for economists worldwide? I think that you're absolutely right, that a lot of economics research is you know, really oriented towards other researchers. Um, and I think, I, just to be clear, I think there's a very important role for that type mm -hmm. of, of research. Mm -hmm. You know, research on economic theory, research on, on statistical methods. You know, these are what enable uh, further advances mm -hmm. in the field. But if, you, if we think about other fields of research, say, um, certainly in, in biology and in medicine and mm -hmm. computer science, you know, one of the things that researchers do, in addition to trying to understand the world better, is they try to develop innovations to address you know, concrete real world problems. Mm -hmm. And I think often these, these th that there's there's synergies between um, addressing real world problems and understanding uh, deeper truths uh, that, that have application beyond one particular context to others. Um, so I think that we're starting to see a shift in economics where more researchers are, are, are working on practical problems and see their role not just as documenting the impact of one particular policy or another, but actually trying to help develop innovations to aid governments and sometimes other organizations like firms in achieving their goals. And you know, we're, um, so we've seen that in in economic theory, for example, in advances in the design of auctions. Um, um, but we're also seeing, uh, with very important real world consequences, but I think we're also seeing that in development economics. And, you know, some recently um, reviewed the, the impact of some innovation funding. Mm -hmm. And we actually found that um, innovation funding that involved uh, development economists and randomized trials was actually more likely to lead to um, to um, scaling up in the real world. So I think that economists have a role to play um, in in innovation as well. And I think that's um, that that would be my my message. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Kramer, for uh, you being so generous with your insights and experiences. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with us at Times Evoke Evolves Knowledge Series. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks very much.